That's, that's amazing. Now I actually have to do something. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you came this morning, you realize that I, I switched my major when I was in college from piano performance to composition because I actually hated performing. So this is sort of a nightmare for me now to be up here with the piano. Like, oh my gosh, wait, I, don't, I already decided not to ever do this. And my other problem that I think I talked about this morning was that, uh, although I don't think I talked about it in my talk this morning, um, is that especially because of all the new technology, lots of things that you used to have to do, you don't have to do anymore. And one of the things I stopped doing was practicing. So <laughs> it's kind of a shame because I have a piano and I should practice, but I don't. Because of, uh, I can put it in a sequencer and fix it. So why should I practice? So anyway, that's doing that. Um, I also used to write handwrite music uh, with calligraphy. It was really pretty, and I don't do that anymore either. So. I'm actually starting to question all those things I've left behind. Just because technology lets me do it doesn't mean that I should, so think about that. All right, so thanks for coming tonight. I am going to do, uh, I'm going to give you all of my secrets. So I'm going to tell you exactly how you can do what I do. It's like really, it's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery, but speaking of the brain, um, the thing that's really interesting to me about music, and I don't think you people would be here tonight if music didn't do this. Music speaks to your emotions. You all know that. It's shocking how many <laughs> people in the academic world, especially in some of the major conservatories and universities that teach composition, have forgotten that music actually speaks directly to the, to the, to the emotions of people. Um, so, thankfully, Mark asked me to come today. There he is. And uh, the people at this school, in particular, and, and there are quite a few numbers of academic places that actually understand how important uh, the emotions are and how music speaks directly to emotions. And of course, if you don't realize this and you actually want to get a job outside of the university, you won't. So just know that. If you want to compose music and you don't believe music speaks to emotions, you will not get a job unless you go to a university. But not this university, because Mark's already told me that's not going to be the way it is. You did too. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I went through the, I got a master's degree from USC, and uh, I, I sort of fought with the professors while I was there because I liked all sorts of music. I liked pop music, I liked rock and roll, I liked progressive rock, I liked jazz fusion, uh, I liked film scores, I liked classical music, I liked contemporary 20th century music like Bartok and Stravinsky, which was passe when I was going to school. Um, so, but I got as much as I could out of the master's degree program because it wasn't the piece of paper that was important as much as the stuff I learned while I was there. I learned a lot of great stuff and that's what, if you're in school, that's what you should do. Take all the good and forget the bad. That's probably horrible. I'm never going to be invited back, I'm not okay. uh, So, and it's funny, I was talking to some of the, the students this afternoon, I, I realized uh, one of the things I did when I was in my master's program at USC, way, way back, this is before MIDI was even thought of, so you can imagine how far back that goes. Um, was one of the extra classes I took while I was getting my master's was a thing called Early Music Ensemble, where I, because I also played flute, I got to play um, Renaissance flutes and Baroque flutes and recorders and uh, crumb horns. Crumb horn? Anybody play crumb horn? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you know what a crumb horn is? Oh, they're, they're horrible. They're just awful sounding, but they're loud, which is fun. Uh, and a funny name, too, Crumhorn. Anyway, so one of the other things I did while I was there was in a little early music singing group, and we sang Gregorian chants. Hmm. So that was something that came in handy. <laughs> it took like 20 years, but I learned how to read Latin and heard how to read the Liber Usualis and, and read the nooms on the page and I, I studied Gregorian chant and it was like that was one of the things I learned and it was really fun and I don't think I got credit for it, it was extracurricular, but it just certainly came in handy uh, many years later. So, so who knows what's going to be important in your education. Um, 
So getting back to emotions of music. So here's one of the cool things. I think one of the reasons you're here is how many of you have played Halo or Destiny at some point? Ooh, okay. Okay, I'm done. Why should I? Uh, so one of the things that I knew because I did jingles was that if you can attach music and melody to something else, it gets into people's heads, and there's what I call emotional equity. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, take away the, this term, emotional equity. You know, what I mean by that is, music goes straight, scientists have told us this, so I believe them, uh, straight into the limbic system or the cerebrum or some part of your brain that I can't remember. Uh, but it's the same part of your brain that responds to food, uh, sex, and drugs. That's just a fact. I'm not trying to be crass here or anything, but think about that. That's a great part of the brain, right? This is not the brain that makes a bunch of hard decisions. It doesn't have to make, have rational thought. It goes, it goes straight to the, the core of what makes you feel stuff. And it's also a big area where memory seems to be located, too. So think about, like, that visceral thing you get, that visceral memory that comes back to you when you smell something you get transported right back to the moment when you first had, when you smell like, you know, buttered popcorn or something, that, that does it for me, but like, who knows, whatever it is that you smell and suddenly your childhood comes back or a moment comes back to you. The music, music can do the same thing. And so what's important about someone like me who's trying to manipulate your emotions all the time <laughs> is that I wanna be aware of the kinds of emotions that I can create for people. I wanna attach them to some experience that are happening, that they're having. And then I'm going to see, like, if that works, now I've got some emotional equity. That piece itself now is sitting in your brain in an emotional spot, and then I can trigger it again even easier later. That sounds kind of like a big cheat, but it's, it's true. It works. It's the secret. If, if you learn anything, learn that. So I'm going to go through some examples. I'll, I'll play a little on the piano. I'll show some stuff, and I'll talk through some of my process. Um, one of the things my professor did when I was a, a college student trying to teach me about melody was he said you should um, look at good melodies and, try, and figure out what makes them good. And I'm like, oh, come on, melodies are just good because they feel good. And he's like, no, no, that's not going to work. You've got to like, study them and figure out what makes them good. I said, well, how do you do that? He says, well, first thing you do, take a good melody that you think is good and see how, what you have to do to make it bad, which is a brilliant thing. Seriously, you should, you should try this sometime. Just take a good melody. And like, how, how many small changes do I need to make before it's a bad melody? And you don't have to do much with some of them. You can make them really bad. So one of the melodies that I looked at, because it was an influence on me when I was a kid, was Yesterday by Paul McCartney. And I analyzed it, and I tried to figure out, like, what was it I liked about it? Why did it speak to me? So let's see. Here's, and now I should not be doing this, but I'm going to try it. So, this is, this is Paul McCartney's Yesterday, sort of. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. So, see, I told you I should do this. Far away. Now it seems as though I'm here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Sorry, I put your dad so horribly. I should do it again, but I won't. Um, so, okay, so just think of that melody. Yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. Da -da -da. They could make it bad if you went. Da -da -da. Da -da 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 you stay in the key instead of doing that little transposition that he's doing. He's moving to a, a borrowed key. But the other thing he does, what happens right at the beginning?
them right there. Now he's singing the third, but he never sang the third until then. Doesn't that blow your mind, somebody? <laughs> it blew my mind because I was used to, there's major chords, there's minor chords. And Paul, right away, in a pop song, is not giving me a chord. He's giving me an open fifth and the ninth or the second. And I realized this sound is consonant. Okay, so a lot of times we think major, minor, those are consonants. Oh, this needs to be resolved, or does it need to be resolved? No, not in pop music and not in a lot of music. So I started realizing that, and I know this is going to sound maybe a little bit weird, but it seems to me that there's so much music, Western music is so reliant on triads and tertial harmony which is major minor, those chords, super important, right? And then you start harmonizing and you go up, you know, you start adding, and you get harmony that goes out and beyond it, and it's a lot of tertial, it means thirds in thirds. But what I also like is just plain old, there's something really fundamental about a chord that's just the fifth, the root in the fifth. And so, okay, major, well, what about this one? Okay, I like that. What about that one? Yeah, I like that. Ooh, um, do I like that? I'm not sure. I might. Mm, I don't know. Do I like that? Well, that's it. I just played all the all the tri chords that you can play between a root and a fifth. I promise I won't, I'm going to get off this soon because this is going to bore too many of you. But it's it's just sort of a fun thing. So. <laughs> This is well. There's that chord. We have Flintstones, kids. Well, you know, I, 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 that's that chord. It's just, it's just that, right? And then here's this chord. Ooh, I like that. So that's. So what I keep doing with my own ears is I, I search for things that sort of give me a little like, oh, that's pretty. I like that. And it's not that complex. Like, you can have really thick, complex, chromatic harmony and jazz harmony, and all that's really cool, but when you want just like a beautiful melody and a beautiful harmony, sometimes all you need is, at the minimum, you can have a melody and a counter melody, like a bass part and a, and a melody, or two, just two voices. So I, I like to do things that are just two voices, or just, if the harmony is just three voices. And if I can do it in three and two, number one, it's easier. <laughs> I don't have to work that hard because I don't have to use that many notes. So that's that's actually a key to some of what I do. So uh, when I was assigned to, it's time to, to come up with the theme for Halo. As you see, I already I'm already using that open fifth with a second chord. I guess you know that I'm going to give Paul credit for, although Paul didn't invent it. But let's just pretend that's what it is. I um, used it for jingles. Um, I even did monk chants in jingles, so it's just, they just weren't quite as popular as Halo, so. <laughs> uh, it was territory I'd already tried to get money out of, so. Um, when it was time to do this thing for um, Halo, we had this, like, we had no time at all. It was like, we were, we got this opportunity to drop in our lap to go to play uh, for Steve Jobs, uh, Macworld 1999, which is, wow, almost 20 years ago. Holy okay. Uh, and we had to come up with something, and we didn't have a sound engine, so we couldn't, we couldn't show the game with sound effects, um, and we didn't have, I didn't have any ability to play music at the same time the game was going. We had a very rudimentary scripted demo of the game that played on a Macintosh. And so I, I said to the guys, I said, let me write a piece of music for it, I'll, I'll record it, and then somebody will hit play on the CD player, and somebody else hits the space bar on the computer, and it'll just, we'll just pray that they run together. <laughs> so, um, you know, you do what you can. That's what we got to do. So I went back to, to write this thing, and on the way to the studio, I was going over to my partner Mike's house. Um, I like, okay, I gotta write something. The, the, the assignment is, it used to sound, make you feel like ancient and epic and mysterious, and, uh, so I thought, okay, ancient monks, got it, monks, I'll do monks. So on the way to Mike's house, I'm like, okay, I need to write a monk chant. 
thinking about Monk's uh, Dorian mode. Um, Dorian is it's a minor scale. It's got a raised sixth, and it's a it's a classic um, mode from the Gregorian days. Wow, that was that was intelligent. The Gregorian days. <laughs> I'm not teaching music history here, am I? Okay. <laughs> So anyway, for some reason, I did it in E. Same scale, just in E. So it's E Dorian, and which it just happens to be the same key as yesterday. So I was thinking through what makes yesterday good. I already knew this. Has one high note. One low note. Four phrases. Unequal phrases. I mean, you didn't know that that was based on yesterday, but as you hear, it's not exactly based on yesterday. It's actually kind of hard to do. But I was inspired by yesterday. One high point, one low point, four unequal phrases. And so I went and I said, hey, Mike, here we're going to do a monk chant. It goes like this. Okay, it sounds good. All right. And then now we need something else. We need something that's heroic. So we're still in, in uh, E. Okay. It's important to hear the, the way that... So I wanted the cellos to go... Oh. Because I knew that was going to sound really aggressive in order to get those notes. They have to go at 10. That's actually at 11. So they had to go over strings and I wanted them to be messy. Some people have, this is the pet peeve of mine, I'm going to tell you all right now, but some people have rearranged halo music and they have some of the cellos go, and other cellos go, So another accompanimental part in this piece. Okay, that's cool. Okay, but how do a lot of people think of it? Yeah, what's wrong with that? It's got all these parallel fourths in it. That's not what I'm doing. That was what I started doing. And I don't like that. And so the other little trick is these are still just three note chords, three notes, three notes, three notes, two notes actually, is when I find myself doing something that's real parallel and kind of boring, I just do a simple thing, which is called contrary motion. Just contrary motion, which is the inner voice. Instead of going up that far, I only went up that far. I even improvised that. I was like, that was boring. I'm just going to like try to move one note contrary to the other note. So it goes in opposite directions. It spreads out. Is that interesting to anybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just telling you how my brain works. It's not all that complex. All right. And, and by the way, it's the picture of the view outside my deck in Seattle. So I, I love this because it's very inspiring. I'm glad I live there. I live in a shack, but I have a great view. <laughs> Uh, that's Puget Sound, so that's actually the Pacific Ocean and Whidbey Island. So anyways, it's a great way to drink coffee in the morning. And these, of course, are sunsets, because I'm never up at sunrise. <laughs> if I lived on the side where I'd have to see a sunrise, I would never see it. So I live on Sunset Lane. It was immediately, yes, that's for me. Uh, okay, so we have to do this track for Steve Jobs. It's the Halo, Halo first time anybody's seen Halo. And I'm going to play that now. Um, 
Yes, Caleb Macworld. If I can't see that little thing in the corner, I'm sorry, you guys, you should be able to see most of the screen, but there's a little reminder there, and I don't have my notes are way over there, so. Halo Mac World. Okay, here we go. Listen for the monks, listen for the, listen for the chugging cellos, listen for the main themes. And think about the fact that I like two-part voice things and I like three, three note chords. I know that seems weird, but if you're thinking about that, you'll be surprised how much I, I, use, I use that. That was an early version that I think that I had that we couldn't even sing to. We just we were just throwing stuff at it and see what happened. And then the, the the final version was different than that. So the final version, the flag didn't get twisted around, and there was no Apple logo because we were we we knew that even then that we probably shouldn't be too associated with Apple just in case Microsoft came. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so there's all that stuff. The other little thing that I wanted to have in there to make it kind of kind of weird was the yeah 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 that guy that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was one of the monks singing, and I was also that guy because when I, I hired the jingle singers in town that I had worked with before, uh, they you know they sang things like with me, Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean. So so Bob Bowker was one of the best singers in town. He could get me some other singers. I said Bob, I need one of those crazy you know, koali voice people, you know, the guys who, you know, sing that, that, that cool chant stuff that's from the Middle East. And he goes, uh, yeah, I think I think got somebody that can do that. So we got in, we did the session, we did the, the Korean chant monks, 
we did that other sort of male chorus stuff that builds in there. And then I said, okay, we need to get, okay, who's the guy that's going to do this thing? And he goes, well, it's either him or this other guy. And he says, what do you want? And I said, well, right during this section here, I want somebody to go like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, uh, yeah, you should just do that. <laughs> I'm like, but I'm just making it up. He says, yeah, so yeah, who cares? <laughs> that's how that happened. Um, all right. Halo Mac World. Halo E3 2000. Oh, okay. So um, this is sort of a cut down thing we did like six months later. Now remember, you know, I was talking about emotional equity. So the very first time in 1999 that anybody heard this, I, one thing I knew that was going to happen was that they were going to be in a dark room. Steve Jobs was coming back from, you know, like he'd been gone forever, right? This was 1999. He'd only been back to Apple for, I think, a year. Was it 98 he came back? 98, something like that? Anyway, so everyone who worshipped Steve Jobs was in the audience, and they were big Bungie fans. They were really looking forward to seeing what is Bungie going to come up with next. And we were really excited to show them Halo. And we, we didn't have any engine to show. To do. We couldn't do narration. We couldn't do voice acting. We couldn't do sound effects. All I could do was do a music track. But I thought, this, this is really um, effective. Because music and visuals, that's all you need to get people's juices flowing. Everything else can help with that. But I'm a big proponent of music with no sound effects, or music with no vocal uh, voices. Because by the way, when you're listening to something that, that tells you reality is happening, like sound effects, or people talking, the music goes just in your brain. It goes down a level. Where if all you're doing is seeing visuals and the music, that's why music videos are so uh, successful, because it's just music and, and visuals, and it works really, really well. So I know, okay, we'll have a captive audience, dark room, music and visuals. If this is good and they like it, we've hooked everybody. Now I have emotional equity, and I can beat that thing to death, which I did for the next 10 years. <laughs> All right, so here we are like a few months later, and now we have to do um, the, the Halo 2, uh, Halo 1 at E3. It was a 10 minute long thing, and some of you have probably seen some of this. You'll, I'll show you this. This is the next level of stuff we were doing. Now we're a little bit more advanced. We've got music, we've got sound, we've got talking, um, and we did this in surround sound. We had our own theater. It was really fun. But I'm, I already have emotional equity. I did it the first time. No one had heard monks singing for Halo. No one had heard chugging cellos for Halo. Now they had. And trust me, if they liked it, which they seemed to do, I wasn't going to walk away from it and do something new. I'm going to like use it because now it's in the emotional memory part of your brain. You're going to you're going to remember it when you see this. Now, one other part I want you to listen for is this part where everybody's where the Marines are running through the Covenant corridors, the alien corridors. And uh, listen to that music. Just try to remember. Same exact thing. See, now that's all I have to do. <laughs> so this is, that's the sunrise chord. Let's call that. So remember that sunrise chord. That's what we off in there.
Lord tried to told us one of you was our Lord, but I didn't believe her. In the air, Lord, that's how you get bound. Let's get you on board. You're staying. in your brain, you're, it's never gonna leave you. That's my goal. Funny thing about that is like, yeah, that was, we didn't, still hadn't hired the right actor to be <laughs> Master Chief, so who knows? He was a nice guy, but he was not the, the voice that we ended up using. Uh, Steve Downs was the voice of Master Chief from then on. And of course, that whole last sequence of the ship leaving and this conversation between supposedly the Marine and Master Chief, that was all scripted and supposed to be, you know, dialogue and the whole thing, but we ran completely out of time and money. We had no ability to animate something that complex, so just play music and have ships flying and we'll just do the voiceover on top. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, okay, so remember some of that stuff that's in there. Okay, so Halo 2. This is uh, Halo 2 now. The announcement for Halo 2 I'm still, now we've done Halo 1, so I've got all the emotional equity in people's brains from Halo 1, so I know I can work with that, and now I have to work with, with that stuff and still expand it. So, this is still going to show up, but I'm going to do something kind of, kind of new. So, that's a variation melody, but it's new. To try to get that into people's brains because it's Halo 2. So here's Halo 2. See how it's just an extension of what I already did, and I was able to play on what I knew was already something that was viscerally exciting to people. Like, 
things that didn't register with people, I wasn't going to go back to, but I knew some of the stuff was going to work. But I could still expand it and go to the next step. So that became the Halo 2 um, thing. Uh, and of course, how many ways can you do the... Uh, well, I would just go... Hold the, the, and have the men hold this and have the women hold it. So it's like, okay, yeah, that all works. Um, and it's still the same thing. I still get the emotional payoff, but it's new. All right, what's next? Halo 2, of course, Halo 3. <laughs> <laughs> so Halo 3, so now my conundrum is okay. Bunch of music for Halo 1, bunch of music for Halo 2. We're coming back. The Halo 3 was, for us, was going to be the end of this massive trilogy. We wanted Halo 3 to be the conclusion. So I wanted to come back to some of the classic Halo themes, but still have something that was new about Halo. So one of the things that happened, which is, I think is sort of funny, but we had been to a lot of E3s, we had done a lot of trailers, and we had shown a lot of stuff over the years. And when you go to E3, which is the Electronic Entertainment Exposition in Los Angeles, and like all the games show there at press conferences, they get huge trailers, huge online presence, everybody's watching these things. And they started, ended up, by, by this time, 20, 2006 maybe, uh, people, who specialized in making trailers, they started using trailer music, they started, everything started looking and sounding the same. I couldn't remember what game was what because those trailers that were trying to get me excited were all doing the same formula. And so I'm like, well, thank goodness we're gonna like do it ourselves, we're gonna do it our way, we're gonna do something that, that is just us and we're not gonna try to do it the way everybody else is doing it. So I remember I was sitting there like, okay, well, yeah, see, let's see, you gotta get back to E Dorian. Like, everybody likes E Dorian. Like, oh, that's kind of nice. <laughs> I said, what if the. What if it just started with piano like that? Like, I knew that, like, no other trailer was just gonna start with octaves on the piano. Like, but I thought, I have enough emotional equity in this, right, that I could get away with doing. Which is ridiculous. As a matter of fact, the marketing people at Microsoft kept laughing when we presented, and I wasn't there, so they didn't laugh at me. But they were laughing and they were saying, well, Marty's going to fix that. Right? <laughs> so the guy, some, some of the guys who were in the, uh, those meetings came back to me and said, yeah, Microsoft doesn't like, you know, the marketing people don't like the piano at the beginning. And I'm like, well, then I'm doing it for sure, I'm going to do that. <laughs> So, uh, you know, this was like, we had been, we hadn't released a Halo game for a while, so this was the triumphant return of us releasing Halo. Um, and I wanted something that would feel like a, a sort of a fanfare majestic comeback of the Chief. So you've got this. Thank you. 
until I could bash you with that. Then you know. So, <laughs> so here's one of the other interesting things. Like, okay, so that's just a big giant fanfare, right? Turning and something sort of poignant and sweet. Ooh, like Cortana. Ooh. <laughs> All right, what a cheat. There it is, geez. How creative. <laughs> things sitting in their brain already. All I had to do was push those buttons again. Boy, I hate to admit that, but seems really <laughs> But if you notice, there was one other thing. I did a piece in uh, Halo 2 that I, I ended up using, I forget where exactly, but it was this piece that went like this. Three note chords. So hear what you, listen to what you're hearing there. This is a, a major triad. Second, no major minor. Back to it. Another one. No, just nine chords. Just nine. Just a nine. So, it's still three note chords. Did you, did you guys remember this one at all? Yeah. the credits. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the emotional equity. I'm using it. <laughs> Thank you. 
announcement trailer when Master Chief came in, it was these chords when he came through the clouds and he finally was revealed. It was these swelly chords. Do a bunch of stuff to it. I'm like, no, 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 I'll just play it that way with some strings and it'll be pretty. Um, and it ended up being nice. I guess I used it in the end credits. Is that what somebody yeah, did? Too, yeah. And I did? And, but it, I think in three, you came back yeah. during certain parts. Yeah, so. we'll get to that. <laughs> so I ended up liking that piece, and I had sort of emotional equity for me, and I used it in the Halo 2, uh, uh, the Halo 3 announcement trailer where Master Chief came through the, the smoke. It just those rising chords came through. So, um, that's how that ended up happening. Uh, why was I showing that to you? What's next? I'm losing my place. Halo 1 end. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going back in time now. So the very ending of Halo 1 um, had a lot of fun stuff in it. But one of the things that I realized is I needed a piece. I needed some more men's chorus thing. I just didn't have enough, believe it or not. And so, but it was too late. I was, it was like two o'clock in the morning. There was some sort of horrible deadline, and I, so I had this idea for a men's chorus piece, but I couldn't. I didn't have the time to record it uh, with professional singers, so it was just me overdubbed a billion times, just me by myself in the studio with the microphone, hitting record a whole bunch of times. <laughs> so that ends up in the game, and it ends up being kind of a major piece throughout the rest of the history of Halo. So here's the ending. And then there's some strings at the end, which end the ending, end the ending. So listen to these things. Chief and Cortana. If you enjoyed the story, you you were like, oh wow, yeah. I just 
just getting started. What does that mean? It means we're going to like do more series at this time. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, that that question. Is also the title screen, the, the t opening title. Like of the, where you select campaign, that's what that was. Was it in there too? Yeah. How about that? I, I, so yeah, when I when I select so whatever I would write stuff for different things, and then one of the last things I would do is like, okay, what I want to put in this music that would circle through the or cycle through the menu screen. And it, it's always been surprising to me because I thought, well, no one's ever going to listen to a menu screen. I really, really, honestly thought that. But I thought, well, I don't want it to be boring, so I'll have a chick, you know, pick different pieces randomly and play parts of it, and apparently people actually listen to the title screen. So I went, oh wow, I better be going careful next time. Um, so once again, I'm emotional equity. I have all this equity I've got um, that's sort of Master Chief coming through the clouds thing. I've got the, uh, you know, this, you know, I still got the, that, that's forever. I don't love to get rid of that. And I've got this mall music, and I'm, I'm piling up more and more stuff that I can start using the... Right? Okay. So here's the opening to Halo 3. This is the opening cutscene. So listen to all the stuff that I, I cheat and just throw at you because you already have an emotional response. Does it say? Yeah, Halo 3 open. Hinting. Sometimes when all I'm looking for are the appropriate places to put the things that I already know are going to have emotional power because they've already had emotional power in the past. So, like, it's amazing how much of that you've already heard. Uh, maybe it's not that amazing, but it is me. All right, so this is when you see the new Halo in Halo 3. And I'll give you one other thing that I, that I loved about working on the Halo series, and this is something I try to do in every game I work on, and that is, and trust me, when people remake games, <laughs> they somehow miss the fact that this is something that we did that's important. And I'll tell you what it is. It's these scripted cinematic moments grew seamlessly out of gameplay. There was no fade to black, wait for a cinematic to load, and then suddenly you like see a pre-rendered cinematic. 
Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> I should have told everyone to silence your phones. <laughs> uh, so, uh, sorry. It's all right. Um, so you'll see some gameplay, and what I like to do is I like to have scores that work during games. They're interactive. We talked about some how to make interactive music in games this morning. But then when we go seamlessly cut into the cinematic, which in all the stuff Bungie worked on, our cinematics were not pre-rendered. They were rendered in the engine, so it was real animation happening in real time with the music playing through it. And I still had to do traditional linear sound design and scoring, but I, it always had to fit with whatever was happening in the game. So this scene will start with some gameplay and then seamlessly go into the cinematic moment, which I think is pretty cool. I think that's, a, I, as a game player, that's the way I like it. I hate it when basically the screen goes black, everything stops, and I'm like, oh, okay, I might as well just go get a snack because they're, they're trying to load a movie that I wish I wasn't watching. This way, I think these people have a chance of at least maybe watching the movie because it flows from the game. So remember that thing I did in Halo 1, where, or the Halo 1 announcement trailer uh, at E3 where it has the alien corridors? Listen to that. I, I did in-game uh, adaptive music when you're running around in the alien corridors using that stuff. Return of the Halo 1, I had a theme for it because I had the month chant, but I redid it with a full choir and reharmonized it with the orchestra. But I knew, I knew that it was Halo 1 coming back, so that's what we got to do. Um, let's see. Uh, which means that we have to go rescue Cortana. So here's one of my, um, this is one of my favorite scenes in the entire series of stuff that we did, especially the first three games. This is when you rescue Cortana. We're going to start with gameplay here. So you finally get back to finding Cortana, which you've been trying to get to for this whole time. And she's been in the clutches of the bad guy. And you don't know if she's going to be OK. So it's, it's kind of an emotional moment if you're paying attention. And uh, what we had to do was you had to fight your way through to this place that had a glass dome on it, and then you had to break the glass dome. So I knew that we would, you were going to cut right to a cinematic as soon as you broke the glass dome. But what I thought would be kind of cool is like, what if we like, stop everything, go to black, and go in complete silence? So you're almost sort of going, uh, did I just did I break the game? Did I hit the wrong thing? I wanted people just to think for the fraction of a second that maybe they did the wrong thing. And then I didn't want to start with music. I wanted to start with just Cortana's voice and then bring music in. So what I also want you to listen to, and now we were talking about this since this morning. Somebody asked me um, about writing themes for people or places. Like this is the Halo theme, this is the Master Chief theme. And 
I never started out writing, this will be the theme for Halo, this will be the theme for Master Chief, this will be the theme for Cortana. But I had emotionally powerful themes that fit certain situations, and they sort of organically ended up attaching themselves later on. So like, suddenly that became the Halo theme. Oh, that sort of became representing Halo, and that and that the rising chords thing. This that feeling became sort of the Master Chief theme, and then this this. That that became sort of the feeling of Cortana, and then we still have. So we have that theme too, and we have we have all those themes. I can play with all those things. So listen for all of them. Count them, check them off. <laughs> Playing this, if you didn't know why maybe you felt kind of like, oh yeah, Master Chief, or oh Cortana, like if you didn't know those things, I mean, the music is telling you kind of how to feel, but there's also, I get to play on this, you know, seven years worth of emotional equity that you've already sort of had hardwired into your systems. So, um, I hope I'm not depressing anybody by sort of revealing these secrets. Because I mean, these are legitimate emotions. I still sort of get shivers when I see this stuff. I mean, I still go, oh, God. I mean, I feel the same way. I mean, if, if I don't feel it, then you're not going to feel it. Trust me. Because. Good. See, I was always hoping people could ever make a scene that, that helps people in a video game that people might cry over. Maybe. Yes. Good. Uh, all right. So, Rescue Cortana. What's next? Oh yeah, the ending. So we remember the ending of Halo One. Well, I get I get to come back to the ending of Halo Three, and like I get to do everything I want to do at the end. So this was actually really pretty satisfying. So we're going to start with gameplay again. And listen to the gameplay. You're going to hear themes that you've been hearing for a while, and the kitchen sink is thrown in. There's stuff you know as a jeep flies into the drop ship, and all sorts of crazy stuff happens. And just listen to all the themes that we've been going over tonight. And then listen, uh, is it a separate ending, or is the ending in this? And anyway, let's, let's play it, we'll play it through and we'll see what happens. It starts with gameplay, it goes into the cinematic.
So that was a good ending, and if I could say so myself. Because <laughs> I got to throw everything in there, right? I mean, it was just great. Like, it's like I could bring back all the things that hopefully people might not be able to identify. Because I don't want you to be thinking about that, like, oh, yes, Marty used that in the second movie. <laughs> but I know it's in there because it goes to that part of your brain where memories and emotions all get mixed together. And I know it's there, and I, I push those buttons, and even I get reclaimed watching it. So. I know it's going to be pretty successful. And then, you know, the guys, Joe Staten, the writer, who is wonderful. I love working with Joe. He wrote the, the script for all these. And we work well together. And so he does the same kind of things. Word, it's so easy. You know, like that was at the beginning of the game, and then it was at the end of the game. And you just feel like, oh, yeah. I don't even know what that means, but it's good. It's cool. <laughs> um, so he wrote this last, this coda scene, which, by the way, I'll tell you a real quick story. Let me know when I'm going over. You guys can leave anytime you want. I'll just keep talking. Um, 
he wrote, uh, you know, the end of Halo 1, and then I saw what the script was for the end of Halo 3, and I thought, oh, this is really cool. Like, this is it's Master Chief again, and Cortana, alone in the ship. And we don't know what's going to happen to them. But we didn't, when we first told Microsoft, this is, this is when we were already officially going to be gone from Microsoft. We made a deal with Microsoft, basically. We'll give you Halo 3, you give us Bungie back. Um, that's essentially the deal. It was, it was a pretty good deal for everybody. Um, so, but Microsoft suits, the top brass of Microsoft, was not really sure that this sort of ragtag group of people were going to like make a good game. They, they, they're like, you guys made Halo 1 and Halo 2, you're good, but can we really trust you to make a good Halo 3? So we did a PowerPoint presentation on the story of Halo 3, and we got to the ending, and it, there was some, you know, rough version of the ending with, with some sort of PowerPoint thing that said this is how it ends, and I had some music on it. I probably had some rough version of this music. And then the screen went black, and then the room went silent. And I went over and I turned the lights on in the room, and I'm like, okay, gentlemen. And they were just like, wait, what? That, that can't be the end, that can't be the end. And I'm like, oh, oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, yeah, there's one more scene. I forgot to play it for you, so this is how it actually ends. This is the code, but they were scared. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Chief? Now listen can you hear me? You heard this music in Halo 1. And I feel like I've lost you music. too. Not this part, but this is the monk part, right? You already know this. It's two voices. What happened? Sure. When Halo fired, it shook itself to pieces, and a number on the Ark. The portal couldn't sustain itself. We made it through just as it collapsed. Well, some of us made it. Music trail into black. Never cut off the black. Music trails into black. You should always have the last word as a musician. <laughs> so, man, I kind of wish we just dropped the mic right after that. And never, and Halo was done. Like that was it. Halo was over. But that's okay. I still like ODST and Reach, and Halo was great. I would love to work on Halo again, maybe. But anyway. Um, yeah. Thanks, but I, I feel like you know that was just a, I was it was so I was so happy that it was when I started figuring out an arrangement of that end piece from Halo One that I was able to use it again in this the ending of this like I didn't know I could play the whole thing and it could fit the scene I didn't know it until I started working with it but it was just like so many things just sort of magically happen it seemed it's, it almost seems like we planned these things we didn't plan any of this. Um, but if you if you're working with like good material, you'll figure out the right way to I think use it. So that's that was fun. So yeah, um, what, how much time do we have?
about 10 minutes? All right, let me think. Um, let's, uh, you know, I'm gonna play something from Destiny, and then I'll finish off with a little something from Golem. Let me see if I can zip through this. You get this, sorry. So um, there's a piece in Destiny that is called the, the Ecstasy. And this is one of those pieces where I don't know. I knew that I the Destiny, you know, I had to throw away <laughs> Edorian and I had to throw away the monk chat, I had to throw away all these scenes. I had to come, figure out a way to come up with some new things that could hopefully be emotional equity into the future of Destiny. And I was sort of short-circuited, but we won't get into that. But some of it still has some power. But one of the pieces was this piece. It's called The, the Ecstasy. And once again, I went back to the idea of a simple melody was harmonized with just uh, you know three note chords. Okay? So listen to the, how simple this is. complex, it got too, the harmony got a little too thick. I wanted to keep it really simple so it would just have that same ability to just grab you. But think about what you just heard. I, I, nothing was ever thicker than three notes. I mean, this an octave is not two notes, right? You know that. It's just one note double. So, three notes. Actually, this is two notes. A, E, A. start making it more interesting by stacking more and more harmonies on top. You can, and that's really cool and interesting at times, but sometimes you can say a lot with very spare stuff. But listen to what happens when you just take those, that simple thing, and I didn't really thicken this up other than orchestrationally thickening it by doubling octaves and stuff, but here's how it is with the orchestra. show one last thing. This latest thing we're working on is called Golem. And for Golem, I decided to sort of go with uh, this, this feel, which is Lydian with a major seven, okay? And it's, it's, it happens to have come from a story about a 
of a couple of kids who lost their mother. And my wife said, hey, you know that lullaby you wrote for Allison, our daughter, when she was born? I'm like, oh yeah, that was kind of nice. I, I should bring that back. So this is that. sounds once I just keep it that simple but orchestrated. So, I just wanted you to hear that because it's really kind of pretty, I think, to hear a piano version of something and then hear just a simple orchestration of it and hear what it does when a flute or a oboe plays the same melody you just heard on the piano. You just get a whole different emotional response, but it's still the same thing. And, oh, how am I supposed to do that? That's, uh, this was the daughter that I wrote this for when our studio burned down. Uh, that piece was survived, it was all burnt around the edges, so she made this kind of cool acoustic painting out of it. Um, so that was kind of cool. So there's the note. That proves, see? Very simple, three note chords, that's it. Uh, and by the way, you can get Echoes of the First Dreamer, which has all this music on it right now. It's available now, yay! <laughs> and it's the musical prequel to this game, it's coming out. And here's my wife, being the mother, singing the melody. coming soon from Highwire Games and I think yeah thank you very much that's the